This is the Kratom Science Journal Club with Dr. Jonathan Cachet, neuroscientist and expert in psychopharmacology. In each episode, we discuss an article in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com, your source for all things Kratom. This episode, Dr. John and I used the journal article Following the Roots of Kratom as a jumping-off point to talk about Kratom history, human evolution and psychoactive plants, Terence McKenna's stone date theory, and drugs in religious cults. Plus, we answer listener mail about Kratom alkaloids and use as an antidepressant. We did a poll on Twitter, and the most popular one was History of Kratom Use. So we looked at this article, Falling the Roots of Kratom. Um, there wasn't that much about the history in this article, but I, we, I kind of followed like some of the source articles, which had a little bit. So it says, uh, the inter- in the introduction, it says, uh, Kratom is indigenous to Southeast Asia, Philippines, and New Guinea. Traditionally, in certain regions of Southeast Asia, the chopped fresh and dried leaves of the tree are chewed or made into a tea. In addition, Kratom preparations had been used for centuries during socio-religious ceremonies. As far as that goes, there's not a lot uh, that I could find that goes back before the 1800s when um, the uh, botanist Corthels discovered it but or named it right fitted into a taxon- a taxonomy that was being developed at the time right it, i don't know if it was necessarily discovered yeah yeah characterized he, yeah but. discovered by a westerner we should say <laughs> there you go there you go <laughs> my tragina speciosa and that was it's kind of interesting with the name is uh some people think it was named for like a bishop's mitre because that's how the leaves are shaped and right, so yeah it's like a, a flat at the bottom and then comes to a peak so if you get a vision like of what would be a classic pope hat yeah i didn't know that either mitre and then the other one and then the other thing was uh mithraism which is a underground cult in the first to fourth century uh during the same time as early christianity that was centered in rome but stretched throughout the Roman Empire, and that was written about in a book called Mushrooms, Myth, and Mithras, the drug cult that civilized Europe. Right. I had I hadn't heard I didn't hadn't heard about a European drug cult during Roman times before. <laughs> have you ever heard? I, about I have that? not either. Right? Yeah. No, no, and you know, so then you like you dig into it a little bit, and of course there were several at that day and age. Um, I was like, oh, well, you know, would these be considered pagans? But what it seems when they're referring to these like historical uh, cults or drug cults were essentially like a group of shamans that had, you know, some of the most potent plants to alter consciousness at the time. And they, you know, them and five of their buddies start using together. Now, all of a sudden, we've got a cult and a a whole religious movement. Um, (laughs) But, you know, it's interesting to think uh, how you know, the, how the discovery back then, or like the happenstancing upon some sort of psychoactive plant um, could be viewed as like a miracle, right? I mean, that was a notable event that then uh, seemingly changed human culture all around it um, because of the discovery uh, and then preservation of these plants that are producing psychoactive compounds. Yeah, and, and this specific cult was has nothing to do with Kratom because it was in... Rome and Europe, so it, they thought it was maybe a mushroom cult. Um, but since kratom is used in uh, religious ceremonies in Thailand, and it's kind of it's kind of like I, I don't know if it's the center, the central focus point of the ceremony, but it's kind of like a offered up to the gods as kind of like a gift type of thing. And, and and it seems like yeah, there was a lot of like shaman, medicine men. It seems like that's how drugs and religion sort of evolve together is that that's what you're kind of just talking about well to some extent to some extent i mean it's interesting to think about you know the relationship of of humans and human history to psychoactive plants um and terence mckenna has a a great quote that says uh i don't take drugs i am drugs Uh, meaning that if you look at the the history of Psychoactive plants, they produce standard metabolites, but then secondary metabolites that have a very close structural relationship with signaling signaling molecules in the brain. Um, So it can seemingly be 
as McKenna put forth in his stone ape hypothesis, that sort of human evolution or expansion of consciousness was driven by sort of the uh, intentional use of these, of these drugs. Um, that also it could sort of go hand in hand with religion. We can, we can unpack things there um, a little bit more, but you know, since the beginning of time, humans have been taking sub- psychoactive substances and those substances or the experience of, of using those substances has always sort of taken them out of the natural world uh, into the supernatural or mysticism or religion, um, you know, however you want to call it. Uh, they all, no matter what the drug is and what the pharmacology of that drug is, uh, there's always this sort of tendency to, when one ego gets dissolved, so like the individual becomes part of a much larger thing, uh, and their role in that is, is supposedly elucidated, uh, you know, from visions or, or the teachings that they get when they embark on these, uh, you know, religious or spiritual, I guess, uh, uses of the psychoactive compounds. So in some ways, if you're thinking about like, well, what came first, uh, religion or drugs and sort of like where we started this question, if you, if you take into totality, like the, the old, the older the archeological evidence is we generally always find humans with some sort of psychoactive plant. They're, they have the seeds for it. They have the dried herb material of it. And it seems to, you know, go very hand in hand with, with uh, human evolution. Um, if that's the case, though, I think it's a weird, interesting chicken and the egg problem. Like what came first, the humans or the drugs, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a quandary, I think, that we don't necessarily are ever going to know the answer to. But if, if the idea is that, you know, what, makes humans humans is sort of uh language or symbolic communication culture more or less then it 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 goes to say that like drug use humans and religion are all sort of there at ground zero like it's a big bang those elements were there and and now we are here today the the terence mckenna thing is is uh you know i think he was saying that maybe like uh early man or or maybe like uh, Neanderthal men or but like pre-homo sapiens were following herds of whatever they are hunting and mm-hmm. uh, found the mushrooms in the dung. And, you know, they must have been hungry, so they probably used them for food. And right. they came yeah. upon that sort of as, as a, you know, higher consciousness type of thing. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, there are... I used to think that there was only one sort of particular species of magic mushrooms that had this, the psilocybin in it. I think it turns out there's almost 2000. So yeah, I mean, basically that was a good overview of the stone ape hypothesis. You know, essentially these nomadic um, human-like primates would be essentially in a constant search for food, um, always sort of hungry. Agriculture had not been invented yet. And so it was almost inevitable that they would find plants that would alter their state of being. And then they would try to find those plants in Ken. I mean, I think like you mentioned in the notes, you know, religious, uh, exp- religious or spiritual explanations for things are sort of there to be built on faith and sort of explain the unexplainable. And as we've gotten further with the scientific method and technologies to, to measure things in different points in time, um, some of those questions have been answered by science and, and we're no longer, um, you know, taking Kratom and praying for the rain gods, right? If that was what they were doing during their spiritual uh, retreats. There's that Kratom book. It's called Kratom and Other My Tragenides. And uh, what a couple, I just read a couple of the essays that were on, like, the free Amazon preview. And um, mm-hmm. the uh, one was talking about how just – plant animal interaction in general like for example tobacco developed nicotine to keep insects from eating it because the insects would uh maybe you know be like poisonous to certain insects um and so in that way like humans also kind of developed intoxicating substances maybe selected them for i mean we see that with like the marijuana plant they're much stronger today than they were even 30 years ago but uh so he, it was kind of talking about the animal plant relationship and that's kind of how psychoactive we discovered psychoactive substances and and there was even something that said uh uh 
coffee might have been discovered after like a shepherd noticed the sheep after they ate it they became right animated and stuff so the shepherd said well why don't i try this stuff and it's right. like oh it ha- helps me uh helps me uh watch the sheep when i have to get up early or related to kratom i imagine uh i mean we know that it's used for manual labor and i i can't imagine that right when humans discovered the kratom plant that it wasn't long after that they began consuming it right yeah i mean i would i would assume the same i mean essentially too they've already had a long history of identifying plants that either taste good or provide nutritional value um, but don't do harm so if we take psychoactive compounds off the table as sort of like a target the thing they're looking for, you know, you're looking for different terpene profiles. So different tastes, things that affect the experience of eating something. So you feel like you ate. Um, but then also those that are like provide nutritional value. So just like the fibers, the carbohydrates, the sugars. So it was only a matter of time before there was like this other uh, sort of category of things that they could choose from. And, it, and it's very plausible that it came from observing animals and animals effects when they when they uh consume these things you know i think there's a there's plenty of funny youtube videos of this one tree fruit tree in in the plains of africa where the fruits fall off and they stay on the ground and they end up becoming fermented and then animals of all walks of life so elephants hyenas cheetahs birds monkeys they're all there essentially getting drunk together they all pass out together yeah Yeah, it's great it's great so you know you could presumably yeah they would have gotten tips from observing how it affected the animals that were with them um as well as that was probably a gauge for whether something was poisonous or not too like whether or not it affected their animals this is from 2012 it spells it K R A T H O M, so it calls mm-hmm. it Krathom. Pattern and consequences of Krathom use among male vi- villagers in southern Thailand. But uh, the one, there was a quote from uh, the uh, farmer, a 70 year old farmer, uh, and he says, In the morning, I have to walk six to seven kilometers to my rice field from my house. I usually bring Krathom to the field. And when I get tired or hungry, I chew it. I could work enjoy- enjoyably the whole day without any need to eat food. When I feel hungry, I chew kratom and drink water and resume working. I don't need food. I want to eat kratom in er- order to work. It helps me be energetic, more active, and tolerant to heat and sunlight so I could plow my field for the whole day without getting tired. Given that it was probably noticed early as a as an edible food source and ever since you know the grueling labor labor of agriculture existed i imagine i mean even maybe even before agriculture cuz hunting hunting isn't easy either <laughs> um right that right. they, that they yeah. started to take it for its effects as soon as as soon as it was discovered yeah it does seem that um it is uh, particularly chosen amongst those that have to do physical labor uh as a career um but like you're saying, physical labor was sort of the default activity, right? Especially when you're nomadic, because we have, you know, let's say 4.5 million years of human evolution. And that's just when we notice that they start getting bipedal. Agriculture, essentially, from the origin stories I've heard on that, too, is uh, watching the animals like eat wheat seeds and then those weed seeds get digested and then put in their poop. And then all of a sudden they start growing in the poop pile. Um, yeah. You're like, oh, wait, we, we don't have to chase this down. We can just, you know, grow this ourselves. It is interesting to think about that in terms of domestication. Cause you know, the, when you look at for the archeological evidence for the earliest use of human psychoactive compounds, there's evidence that existed prior to agriculture. Um, especially with a, a plant like cannabis, for example, where it has nutritional value as a food, um, the fibrous value, you know, an industrial perspective, mm-hmm. then also this sort of psychoactive or medicinal use. Um, it seems like it knocked all three of those, uh, you know, right off the bat, even back then. Uh, otherwise, if it was just a plant that was sort of not a big part of their lives or their culture back then in human history, we wouldn't expect it to be found like in burial sites, you know, with, uh, with kings and other leaders or queens. We wouldn't also just find, you know, cannabis seeds or evidence of cannabis use, like charred pipes and stuff. We wouldn't find them in when we when we find humans or human fossils, especially the ones that are preserved well in ice. Almost all of them have 
uh, cannabis seeds on them or some other psychoactive drug. Um, and so, you know, it, it depends on when you say modern humans started, but it seems like it was always there from the beginning. Interesting. I, I, I'm not really aware of any uh, findings of like uh, kratom and, and uh, archaeological digs or anything like that, like buried with people. So I'm not, I'm, I'm sure it exists, but I haven't seen any of the like ancient history. Yeah, yeah, particularly, it would be and probably definitely someone working on that. You yeah. know, my uh, my wife's a paleontologist, and uh, when she describes the sort of situation of things that have have to happen to create a fossil, um, it's sort of amazing that we have that we're finding any right. So it's uh, with kratom. I'm not sure exactly what the botany is in terms of seed production, but you consume the leaves. There wouldn't be anything really left when you're doing with that. If the seeds were in satchels, that would be one thing. But you know, it's it's a rare it's a rare hap- uh, like set of geological happenstances that occur in order for a fossilized to be you know perverted, that, solidified that much, mineralized. Um, the first recorded observation by Western of kratom was I don't I, I guess it was that Korth guy. He worked for the Dutch East India Service from 1831 to 1836, and he quote-unquote, discovered Kratom. He didn't right, really discover right. it, but he was the first wet Westerner to write about it, at least. I, so I did a little bit of searching, and I got to commend you. So, you know, we jumped into this article, uh, thanks to the, the listeners uh, filling out the poll to get into the history of Kratom. So this is one of the best, at least peer-reviewed articles that we could, we could find to do that. Uh, but we dug in, and uh, essentially... Um, they did a literature review and we can get in the ins and outs of that. But I want to just commend you, Brian, for going like, okay, they, they say a sentence about early Kratom use and then you go check that source to see what that source actually says. You know, there's, there could be a lot that's lost in translation there. Some of the older papers that I could find on Kratom within the, within the scientific literature or, or journal publications, one was in 1988. Um, and it was on the ethnopharmacology of Kratom and Kratom use. The other ones that just sort of caught me by surprise was I searched the Library of Congress, so loc.gov, for Kratom, and they have just recently revamped their entire digital platform. But mentions of Kratom in the newspapers seem to be going as far back as like 1856, Wow. Uh, in some of the, yeah, the Library of Congresses, there's not a lot, you know, maybe 10 hits or so, um, but they were all mentioned in uh, uh, newspaper articles that were essentially describing some uh, exploration or adventure visit to uh, the South Pacific Islands. Oh, okay. So they would be American newspapers? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. the Library of Congress, yep. Oh, huh, that's interesting. I guess there was a lot of that. Um, uh, what's that guy, Wasson? That was... That was in the early 20th century, I think, uh, with Maria Sabina. And I think there was a guy, Watson, who went down to Mexico, and but it, it, was, it was like in the 20s or 30s, and there was a medicine woman named Maria Sabina who did, like, she was, like, kind of the last of her tribe that did, uh, you know, like, mushroom healing ceremonies. And... Uh-huh. Um, I think eventually, I mean, she lived into the 60s, because eventually, uh, like, John Lennon went and visited her, and uh, eventually a bunch of, you know, hippies started going down there just so they could pick mushrooms, and 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 she even said that once the kids in the funny clothes started coming, the uh, the uh, mushrooms lost their power, because, <laughs> because it was like, you know, they were just coming down there to get high, they weren't there for, to be, for like, healing ceremony purposes. <laughs> Right, uh, right. It's kind of like, that's kind of what reminded me of. It's kind of like ethnobotany adventurism, like what the Mm -hmm. McKenna's did. They went into South America and did ayahuasca rituals and stuff like that. One of the first things that I uh, realized beyond the sort of faith value of Europeans coming over and sort of wiping out all Native American cultures. So that's, you know, in and of itself bad, how it went down. One of the things that they did very quickly was sort of identify, and it was a tight correlation between religion and drug use. And they very quickly wanted to get rid of the religion. And because of that, also the drug use followed. And so it, was, yeah. it wasn't really until the white Europeans showed up um, that we have records of this stuff being used. But then once they got here, 
they completely destroyed all the records because they, you know, their God was the only God, Christianity for all. Um, and so we've lost uh, a huge amount of human information and experience from these native cultures all around the world after we got there and it sort of destroyed their cultural library uh, and any sort of artifacts of it in the name of Jesus Christ. That, I don't know if that's how exactly how it went down with Kratom, because we come up in 1943 in Thailand, and it's the Kratom Act. The Thai government was trying to gain control of the opium uh, industry, so and a lot of people were using Kratom as, a, uh, as an alternative to opium. They, they were getting fewer taxes from the opium industry, um, so then it became illegal in Thailand, in 1943, I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, European colonialism, um, right? But uh, yeah, I noticed that there's parallels to that today. A lot of people are using uh, kratom for uh, opiate alternatives. That means the drug companies aren't getting their money. The FDA isn't getting their fee money. So it's kind of like the same with the Thai government in 1943 and what the FDA is doing now. Is uh, trying to ban kratom because of its use in its natural state, its effectiveness, and relative uh, uh, low expense. Yeah, and, you know, the tax demand cometh, right? The governments, yeah. no matter where they are or what period of human history, uh, if there's uh, some economic activity going down that they're not getting a lick of the cone on, they'll do, the, do whatever they want and whatever they can to, to get involved in that transaction. The last couple of decades, the uh, tr sort of drug war has kind of stepped up in Thailand. You know, it's kind of like brutal sort of crackdowns if they want to on, on Kratom, which grows still grows wild there. But recently they just legalized it for uh, medicinal use, and now I think they're going to completely uh, legalize Kratom and cannabis in Thailand, which is great. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's good that those laws are opening up. I mean, we talk about it, you know, plenty of times in, on this podcast. But uh, the war on drugs and, and ending drug use via prohibition uh, never has been, nor will never be, uh, a successful way to to reduce drug use amongst uh, amongst humans. That, that was sort of one of my favorite quotes from this paper. The very first one, you know, use of psychoactive substances uh, is a constant and consistent cross-cultural feature of uh, humans. And so this notion of a war on drugs, it's sort of like, you know, it, it's, it falls victim to the, the idea that some goods are, some drugs are good, some drugs are bad, when really drugs just e exist and that our relationship with them and, and use of them is, is what sort of defines the, the quality or um, the potential uh, danger of the experience. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it has, it has it's, take a white man coming in to essentially uh, punish uh, the, the original peoples for their use of these things in a religious way. And it was their, not their uh, indignation on the use of the compounds. It was more about their God, not, not this God. And so, it, you know, drugs or even using the term drugs is always sort of about the other uh, yeah. and less about what they just exist and how they, you know, how they interact with the body. Yeah. And, and in that other paper, um, uh, traditional users, most traditional users do not see the serious adver adverse consequences of using it. And then it goes on to say well, that there hasn't been any, you know, a, a lot of research. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. But it seems like the traditional users' uh, opinions line up with the modern users' opinions where there's not really any serious danger in general you know someone's not getting paid or a market's moving somewhere so they want to they need to to demonize it or it's interesting i mean every culture has a, a psychoactive substance of preference right and generally they try to outlaw the, the psychoactive substances that all the other cultures use it's always a, this us versus them dichotomy it, it's sort of the conundrum that we're in now with, like, let's say, coffee, tobacco, and alcohol and, and the state of contemporary drug education, which is more about propaganda and hysteria than it is about objective, you know, acknowledging the objective truths about the ones that are illegal and, and the objective truths about the ones that are, are legal. Um, it's always mm -hmm. framed as the sort of us versus them mentality when it shouldn't. It doesn't have to be. Oh, I was going to say that c kind of coffee, alcohol, and cigarettes are drugs of choice of sort of the working class, meaning anybody that works, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and it seems from that quote I read from the 75-year-old uh, 
farm labor that Kratom seems to be more of a uh, better <laughs> a better a better uh, thing for work than coffee, cigarettes, alcohol, which make you feel good in the moment, but ultimately run you down. <laughs> It's interesting. I mean, yeah, it just goes back to what we were saying about good versus bad drugs, right? It's like, yeah. you know, coffee and a coffee break are all legitimate cultural uses um, with no shaming or, or shunning of their users. Um, but that could have easily just been some other drug, right? It's just sort of an arbitrary uh, happenstance of history more than anything else. Yeah. Um, for sure. You know, I, I wish there was a little bit more. Uh, on Kratom, like, you know, we have the history of coffee goes back real far. The history of, of poppies and, and opium goes back really far. And, you know, the, for coffee, for example, there were these coffee houses where all the philosophers wanted, but it, it's still the scope in which I'm familiar with is still just the history of Western cultures and Western civilizations. And it's unfortunate we had this destructive nature about us as we spread where a lot of these records are just lost. Um, but who knows what we could know if, if we, uh, rather than destroy those records, we, we preserve them. So I guess I just wanted to run through briefly okay. um, what exactly they, they did in this uh, paper and just some notes that I made about the article in general. Sure. Um, so this was an a, a author-heavy publication. I think there's 10-plus authors, all of them representing you know, international uh, cohort of, of universities, right? So we have Italy, we have, uh, I think, Japan and China. Anyways, so the, this was written by an international group of scholars represented across uh, 10 different universities. And what they did was perform a literature search. And so they searched uh, PubMed, PsychInfo, and Medscape for uh, keywords like Kratom, uh, Metragenine, Spinoza, Metragenine, 7 hydroxy Metragenine, um, and then pulled up all the papers they could get back uh, and then dug into those a, a little bit more. Um, essentially, they walked away with 113 studies in the literature review that were critically analyzed. Most of them were about um, preclinical data or in vitro pharmacology and behavioral effects. Uh, the second biggest bucket was analytical chemistry techniques for identifying uh, Kratom. And then the, the smallest amount was, was toxicological reports or epi epidemiological reports on Kratom use in humans. Um, so they looked at these papers and, and did these searches from January 2008 to April 2015 when this paper was, was published in 2015. I did uh, a similar search using those exact keywords and... In Google Scholar, there's a, and I'm taking away patents and citations, there's about 5,000 results hit. Um, and then when I search a, a broader, like open source scientific literature search using a, a platform called the Neuroscience Information Framework, uh, that came back with uh, 1,200 published studies on Kratom. Um, and, you know, that doesn't include the variants of how Kratom is spelled that these authors are obviously aware of, you know, with the H O M. There's different variants, but mm. at any rate, the, I would say the amount of published scientific literature studies on Kratom um, that exists now from 2015 and now is almost double. So the, the yeah. body of Texas is rapidly growing, um, and it would be interesting to sort of see uh, some sort of other meta-analysis done now uh, in 2020 to see where the literature, like publications have been over time. I mean, it looks like the first time they were mentioned 1940, and then we get a steady uptick in the 60s. And then, of course, after 2000s, we're just going through the roof in terms of publications per year. It's it's recently just skyrocketed even further. Mm -hmm. Kind of mm -hmm. looks like a COVID uh, chart there. <laughs> sure, yeah, exponential growth. <laughs> now that we're all familiar with exponential growth, that's what the <laughs> the publications per year looks like, for sure. Yeah. Uh, another interesting aspect of this study, or sort of where the authors of this start study end up concluding, of course, any researcher that is getting grant money from the government has to say that there's more research that should be done, right? Got to keep that, uh, that, that afloat. Um, but yeah. they also essentially are saying that um, because interest in Kratom has grown, and the internet exists, that use of Kratom is now more risky uh, than I, apparently than it was in the past. And I just feel like that's a bit of a, 
a bit of a stretch that, you know, they should have necessarily taken it that far because uh, alongside, yes, the online stores and, and the user experience forums are also, you know, this type of science that we're reading now. So the, the uh, amount of shitty information or fake news and the amount of high quality information, uh, scientific studies are sort of growing at the same time. And at least now uh, people have the benefit of being able to get exposed to, to some of those things. Um, just to some of that content. So, you know, they, they say that, you know, given that it's growing in popularity and the internet exists now, uh, it seems like Kratom use is more risky. I would say Kratom use and use of Kratom has not changed its riskiness um, at all, unless yeah. uh, you're talking about adulterated adulterated products. So when, as the market grows, there's more products on the market. And, you know, they specifically mention. uh, uh, Krypton or Krypton, yeah. which um, was adulterated with something like tramadol. So yeah. you know, that's where I think things can get more risky. But but even at that, you know, before someone takes one of these uh, Krypton or Krypton brands, at least if they Google it first, they should be able to find that adulterated adulterated ingredients have been found in kratom, and and then make a safer decision. I hope uh, people who are listening didn't expect a comprehensive history but I think there's a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we could, we could dig more, more into it. I think a little bit, or we could, yeah. you know, essentially, you know, maybe one of these weeks we could perform the same analysis they did just looking at the body of literature these days. Um, yeah. but you're right. We need to find pro- more primary sources uh, on the history of Kratom use in order to elucidate it a little bit further to a further extent. We're, we're essentially trying to uncover the history, right? We, yeah, we yeah. found this article that, that's supposed to speak to the history. Um, we dove a little deeper in some of the primary uh, sources and references, but it, it's certainly not comprehensive, nor, nor are we attempting in this podcast to present a comprehensive history of Kratom use. This is a man. So this is uh Ms. Quan M S Q U N. I asked for, you know, is there anything you guys wanna know about uh Kratom? This is this is just like a general question last time, so it's not specifically uh-huh. on the history or any topic. But uh at MSQUN says breakdown of the known alkaloids, not just the main few, but the other plant alkaloids and their known properties, while they are to a lesser degree. I feel like so many don't really know there's far more to the whole leaf than simply my tragedine and seven O. Uh I'd love the others to get She's like more she wants to hear about the other alkaloids, well. and I we right. do have a page on uh, kratom science where we um and I replied that to her. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, and so yeah, there are other alkaloids in kratom besides the active ones. And, and certainly, I think that there is um, added benefits for the whole plant consumption, sort of a crude consumption, because you get all of these alkaloids as well, and it's not just about metragenine and seven hydroxy metragenine, um, but because these, you know, I think there's uh, 40 unique or structurally related alkaloids in the kratom plants that we know about or characterized thus far, because they're at such lower concentrations in the leaf, it's a lot harder to study those in depth. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, you can bet your buttons that the, especially like pain, pain management pharmaceutical companies are looking at all the different variants on this skeletal structure uh, that they can. Uh, to make a, a, a safer, um, chronically used or re- less tolerance building uh, opiate for pain management. Um, so <clears throat> the alkaloids of those 40, all of them are indole alkaloids. And indole describes uh, the bicyclic or ring structure. Uh, it's a six-membered bending ring fused to a five-member uh, pyroli ring. Um, indoles are very common throughout, uh, the animal kingdom and plant kingdom. Um, they are structurally related to, uh, tryptophan, um, which is the precursor, uh, for the neurotransmitter serotonin. So they're highly related or structurally similar to a lot of the catecholamines, uh, particularly serotonin. Um, I found it interesting just broadly about the indole alkaloids, 
Um, they regulate several aspects of bacterial physiology, including spore formation, plasmid stability, resistance to drugs, biofilm formation, and virulence, or its ability to sort of hop from host to host. Um, so it's very, I mean, it's very weird, and plenty of his history of uh, pharmacology or, or ethnopharmacology uh, books and texts have been dedicated to the, the question of kind of like at the beginning, the chicken or the egg. Why would these plants have molecules in them that had activity on, on human brain uh, cells? We don't really know the answer to that, but we know that the indole uh, uh, two-ring structure is highly conserved uh, as a secondary metabolite is that the basis of our biosynthesis of our, our catecholamine neurotransmitters. Um, but, but why and how it ended up that way, it, it, very hard to tell. Um, included in those indoles are also uh, a lot of the psychedelics like uh, psilocybin mushrooms and ibogaine. Uh, Reserpine is one in the flowering plant uh, that, that has, you know, documented use up to 1,000 B.C., um, it would be interesting, and I guess I may be jumping off a little bit too, but and maybe this would be better in the in the bulk of the pod. But it would be interesting to if like what if it was such that humans found a plant that isn't around today, right? It's like a um, an early ancestor of coffee or cannabis or some of these other flowering plants with the zindel, um compounds in there. I wonder if we just selected for the indole compounds of and of themselves, and then they changed over time through domestication and repeated growth of, of human activity. So like maybe um, there was something about that precursor of the indole molecule that caused different effects that they could notice, and then they pushed that further along and ended up with all of these different variants. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't think we'll ever be able to know. Um, but that that indole alkaloid and psychoactivity is, is uh, widespread. So that so all of them, all of the other alkaloids in kratom so far that have been discovered are indole indole alkaloids. So they have the indole um, backbone, so the two yeah. rings, and then on top of that, like I think it's monoterpenoids. So you start with that indole skeleton, and then you add different. Uh, uh, auxiliary groups or tertiary structures, and, and typically that involves a monoterpene, you know, terpenes coming up again, um, to, to get to where, you know, to get to where we are at with the metragenine. Um, but I, let, me, let me just say real quick, um, in terms of an in-depth overview of the known alkaloids, I, you know, we, I would refer you to read up on uh, the Creative Science blog where they do have uh, known alkaloids and alkaloid effects. Um, so that'll give you a good list and give you some very pre preclinical information about what their effects are. Um, but you, you got to understand that the studies aren't there yet. And a lot of these are, are cellular or physiology studies when we were able to isolate a little bit of these other alkaloids um, and see how it affects uh, cell behavior. There are very little, if any, um, documented studies about the use of these uh, additional alkaloids in humans um, to any certain degree. This is also, I think it's about four years old. It was definitely written before I... Uh, uh, wrote about Cranium Science, and we've even talked about updating it, uh, especially since all those uh, new studies have come up in right. more recent years. We could probably uh, update this list. It, it's a pretty good basic list, and a lot of the alkaloids on there, you have to remember, it's like less than 1% of the total alkali content, so even right, if it right. works as uh, like uh, immunostimulant or uh, muscle relaxer or different things, it doesn't necessarily mean that Cranium Kratom has that effect. E even so, some of these alkaloids can be found in other plants more efficiently, like in a higher content. Which you know, with some of them, I think there was a mitrophylline. Uh, that was uh, that was it's it has an anti leukemic effect, but that doesn't mean that kratom cures leukemia. That means. Uh, <laughs> well, it means at the cellular level, yeah. yeah this this compound showed. Um, promise yeah. in killing or stopping the growth of uh, an immortal cell line in a petri dish, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's different when you when you look at it in vitro as well. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's they're not found in high concentrations. They can be expensive to synthesize. Um, and I like what you said about just because the effects of something at the 
at the cellular physiological level or even in mice uh, doesn't mean that we'll see that in humans. Um, and it, it could also be the case, I would just add, is that some of these alkaloids could be antagonistic to each other. Like when you take them mm -hmm. together, there's different effects if you take them separately or not. And so that's, you know, it's definitely worth considering. And it's also worth understanding that um, as a potential, um, I guess it's neither pro nor con, but the fact that they synergistically work together, which is almost always the case, is, is a tip to the hat of how important the sort of crude natural plant medicines are. So like if we had metragenine just in a, in a you know, modern pharmaceutical pill, I don't know if it would have the same properties as, as Kratom at, in the natural leaf form. So there's other a uh, couple other tweets we got Erica M1377 and also Just Be um, both ask why kratom works as an antidepressant. It's the okay yeah learn more about how or why kratom has antidepressant effects. Well yeah. so there are um, several possibilities. Um, the first one is the removal of pain and the second one is involved in its um, in its pharmacology. So um, repeated exposure to stress, injury, or pain um, can put people in a state of, of learned helplessness, as we talked in a previous podcast, or, or what could be called depression. Um, and eliminating uh, the pain um, or the stress felt, physiological stress felt by that injury um, can be rewarding and antidepressive in and of itself. Um, so just getting out of a, a state of sort of chronic uh, even if it's low, you know, low intensity pain, removing that pain can be antidepressant in and of itself. Um, so there's that. Uh, but then let's say you're not in pain, but you're still feeling uh, generally elated or, or um, feel more socially active when you take Kratom. Um, I would say that the sort of behavioral activating effects that we see that could be considered antidepressant are due to the fact that uh, the alkaloids bond and interact with our cat catecholamine system, so primarily serotonin uh, and dopamine. Um, we understand that the serotonergic, adrenergic, dopaminergic pathways are all uh, modified. Their signaling pathways are all modified uh, when you take it. Um, and so just by that activity alone, that's probably where the mechanism for antidepressant like activity uh, rests. We are, you know, Brian and I are trying to stay on top of it with the science that's coming out now because it's coming out more and more. Um, but it just is the case at this point that we don't really know much beyond uh, these broad, broad pathways in which uh, the, the kratom alkaloids have activity. So, <clears throat> I don't know if it's a, a satisfactory answer to the question, but removing pain can be antidepressive, but then also this activity at serotonin and, and dopamine and the adrenergic system um, it will lead to its antidepressant effects. I'm pretty sure the last paper we did on uh, the Journal Club was about antidepressant effects. Is that right? Or is it the one before that, two weeks ago? Yeah, I, did, I remember talking about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I would encourage you to uh, – Check out those previous discussions. Remember, set and setting always has a huge uh, impact on how drugs are experienced as well. And uh, Just Be asked another question. She said, uh, I took opiates for 10 years. Uh, it might be a he, too. I'm sorry. I, didn't know. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I took opiates for 10-plus years, got clean for 45 days, and had severe anhedonia before I started taking Kratom. That was about a year ago. I wanted to take Kratom for a year and then see where my baseline is. Will it be worse or better? I don't know if you understand that question or be better better question for uh, like her physician or something. Or... Oh, yeah, cer certainly there would be a disclaimer that says everybody's different, right? Yeah. And um, you, you know, you got to be careful. You got to if you can. It's almost impossible to do, but if you can minimize the expectations on what you're going to or not going to feel when you take a, a psychoactive compound, it, it's, it's, it is impossible to do. It's impossible to, to completely eliminate any expectations. Um, but like I just mentioned, the set and the setting, the set being your mental attitude going into it has a lot to do with how those experiences unfold. Um, so everybody has a slightly different biochemistry. Um, 
uh, the genetics all the way up to the, the meal they just had. And so everybody's different. It's hard to um, broadly generalize. But I think what, what we're essentially saying is uh, she was using prescription opioids for 10 plus years, uh, got clean for 45 days, um, but during that time was experiencing some pretty bad anhedonia. Uh, so anhedonia is sort of a, a lack of uh, feeling pleasure or um, rewarding uh, behavior that typically is something that you did enjoy. So it's widely reported um, with opiates and opiate uh, abusers that they, when they stop taking the drug, they have a hard time uh, just feeling pleasure from like social interactions or uh, eating a good meal um, uh, or, you know, engaging in some sort of lovemaking activity. So th- there's less pleasure in what was previously a pleasurable experience. Yeah. Um, so stop, took prescription opiates for 10 years, uh, got clean for 45 days, and then was uh, not feeling very much pleasure in day-to-day activity um, before she started taking Kratom. So she, now, he or she has been taking Kratom for about a year and then would like to see where their baseline is. Will it be worse or will it be better? Um, so I'm assuming they want to know if they stop taking the Kratom, they want to know whether baseline sort of, uh, uh, you know, dopaminergic state is to a certain extent, but if that anhedonia has, uh, gone away or if it still remains, uh, the same, uh, or worse, it, it's hard to say. I think that your expectation of what, uh, is going to happen when you stop to reestablish your baseline is going to have just as much an effect as, as the sort of pharmacological changes that have occurred. Um, I also, we also discussed on this podcast too, that, uh, Kratom has different long-term physiological profiles than standard opiates, namely, uh, the, the non-recruiting of the beta arrestin and what seems to be the primary pathway into developing physiological tolerance. Um, so if that's true, one could hypothesize that, um, one year clean from opiates that, uh, produce that tolerance effect and using Kratom, which doesn't produce that tolerance effect, that your baseline could have come up, that you should experience uh, such a severe anhedonia. Um, but I, you know, I guess I would say if we're using scientific evidence and data as uh, the threshold, then in terms of the confidence of what may or may not happen, it's about 50, 50. It's a toss up. It could be either, or, um, you know, I would, I would just say, you know, go into it with as little expectations as you can and then report back to us on how it worked out because it, it would be interesting to get that sort of anecdotal uh, evidence of whether it, whether your anhedonia decreased or lessened, which I assume would be a better thing, um, or if it stayed the same or if it got worse. You know, shoot us, uh, shoot us a message at, at Kratom Science on, on Twitter and we'll, we'll uh, certainly see it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We'll follow up with B. Thank you, Dr. John, once again for another Kratom Science Journal Club discussion. And we only scratched the surface of the uh, Kratom history there, so there's a lot a lot to dig up on that. It's a, still something that hasn't been quite studied enough, just like everything with Kratom, so we're trying to do that here. The music is Captain Big Wheel, the song is Moon Runner. For more information on all things Kratom, see KratomScience.com. Take care.